Believe me, I didn't ask him that question. A lot of Panky's testimony wasn't about responding to questions. It was a stream of consciousness that often didn't seem to have anything to do with the case against him, or make any sense. I believe that we are living in the last days, and after this lifetime, there will be a thousand years of millennium. Okay, so this is Steve Panky, and I'll give you a, um, a sort of a quick uh, synopsis, uh, if you will. State anyway. I had told so many lies over the years. When the All right, so he had told so many lies. What he was uh, you know, on trial for and convicted of was killing this girl here, Janelle Matthews. Looks like I spelled it wrong there, but uh, this was like in 1984, if I remember right. I remember this as a kid and um, seeing her picture and stuff, and I, I don't know. He was convicted just a few years ago I believe doesn't matter who cares so I just want to share that clip with you uh, to show you uh, for one well, it wasn't about responding to questions it was a stream of consciousness that often didn't seem to have anything to yeah just how nonsensical this idea of a millennial reign is and he's one of them a murderer and a liar his whole life and he believes it why not because he has faith in the Bible, but because he listens to false teachers. Nothing to do with the case against him, or make any sense. I believe that we are living in the last days, and after this lifetime, there will be a thousand years of millennium. All right, so think about that. There's going to be a thousand year millennium, and what I can't really uh, get people to admit is what happens when this thousand year period is over All right. are there going to be unsaved people living during this thousand year period are you going to be uh, changed in the twinkling of an eye and are you going to be in your resurrected body living among people who are in the this um you know corruptible body you know where they're having sex committing sin are you going to be there right there with them is that what you're hoping for? Just to be, you know, part of the party or whatever? I mean, it's nonsensical. That's why I call it a zombie doctrine. It doesn't make any sense. Now, um, there's a couple things here. Let me go here first. All right, so this gentleman here, he makes, I believe I've uh, talked about him before, Derek Smith. He's, he's one of these guys that... Uh, uh, he, <laughs> he believes the same thing as Steve Pankey, all right, just like Steve Pankey. All right, same, same thing as Steve Pankey. And hold on a second. He turned away in shame. The state anyway. I had told so many lies over the years. I told so many lies over the years, just like Steve Pankey. Derek Smith believes the same thing. And so I comment on his video he made two days ago, uh, trying to encourage him by saying he's getting closer. All right, and of course I I'll point out uh, Luke uh, chapter one where it says he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there is no end. Right there it is. Okay. Now. This is interesting because it's fascinating to me when somebody holds a worldview, they'll purposely ignore logic and truth. It's incredible, really, and it makes me wonder myself, am I doing the same thing? And I think that's important to examine your own self in that sort of way. Am I wrong? You know, it's easy to look at somebody and say, oh, you're dumb, you're stupid, you know. But what about yourself? I mean, can you judge yourself with the same measure that you're judging others, right? Now, I want you to look at this. All right, Jesus says, or I'm sorry, pardon me. He, Derek Smith says, Jesus is reigning over my life right now. 
Yeah, he's got it, man. He's got it because Jesus reigns over the house of Jacob forever. And of course, you know, Jacob is Israel over the house of Israel, which is the kingdom of God, which is God's holy people. Right now, are we the holy nation of God? Right now, are we God's people? And of course, Jesus reigning over the house of Jacob means Jesus is reigning in your life right now. When you are born of God, you have Jesus in you, the Spirit of God in you. Right, so um, I'm going to go, I'm going to read the, this, but hold on. Let me scroll down here, and you'll notice on the last line, once this happens, he begins to reign. So he goes notice the double speak here Jesus is reigning over my life right now and then he says once this hasn't happened yet once it happens then he begins to reign so that's that's not being honest at all right not being honest money for the first trial for the jury I had told so many lies over the years that's not not being honest at all okay so I just want to point that out because uh, he'll go and he'll talk about Revelation 11. If I remember, it. there it is. Okay. Okay. His earthly reign hasn't started yet. Okay. Uh, I think it's important again to remind people that there is no mention of Jesus reigning. A thousand years in Revelation 20 it's just not there it's saying we live and reign with Christ right now and the reason why this is a unique time period is because this is from the time of baby Jesus to the time of his promised return and we Christians are now the nation of God so this is a unique time period and that's coming to an end on judgment day when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it's coming to an end and we see this right here when Jesus comes in the clouds this is it right here that's parallel with every mention of Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven in particular uh, Matthew 24 verses uh, 29 through 31 it's, it's talking about the same exact event when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven you can't get around that I mean you could be dishonest you can Money from the first tell lies the I had told so many lies over yeah I mean but it doesn't change the truth okay now uh, revelation 11 you know I should I should probably uh, go back over and like do like a redo of uh, the chapter of Revelation, do a breakdown of each chapter, but uh, I don't want to get off topic here. But um, to say that Jesus is not reigning right now is dishonest, and to point to Revelation 11 is wholeheartedly dishonest. All right. And I, I mean, if you want to play that game, I could I could play it too. But let's take a look here at 1 Corinthians 15. And maybe this will uh, turn a light bulb on for somebody. Uh, starting, I'll just start in verse 19. In this, I'm sorry, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Now you've heard me compare that with blessed um, are they that uh, what is that? The rest of the dead live not again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. And of course Jesus being the fruit, first fruits of them that slept he is the resurrection he is the f first resurrection we are partakers of that resurrection and the fulfillment of that resurrection is upon his return when we are lifted up in the clouds 
of heaven, just as Daniel prophesied in uh, chapter 12, if I remember correctly, where he says, Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Okay. So, okay, so let's go, where am I at here? For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Alright, think about that. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Okay, let's go back here. Then comes the end. <laughs> All right, and when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. Okay, so um, I know people are confused about this, and they really ought not be confused. It's not confusing. Okay, let me try to make it real simple. Christ is the Savior, the Messiah. All right. Now, when we are transformed or changed in the twinkling of an eye when we are resurrected into our glorified incorruptible bodies we no longer have the desire and need for a savior all right that's we only need a savior uh, right now because we are very infallible once we are once everything is fulfilled then we no longer have that desire. Okay. Now, um, so what? Okay. So he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father. All right. So Jesus is the Father. He is the Christ. He is the Spirit. He is all of it. Okay. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. So. This goes back to Genesis 3. I will put enmity between thee and thy woman. I'm sorry, between thee and the woman. And between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head. And it shall bruise his heel. Alright. So this goes all the way back. Alright. And then when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. We are lifted up to meet the Lord in the air. And then... Jesus stomps his heel on the head of the serpent, destroying death forever, destroying all sin forever, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is ex accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued, unto him then shall the son of man also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him that God may be all in all okay again notice when it says that the son which is parallel with the Christ the Savior the servant of all man when this is completed we no longer have that necessity for a savior we're already um, changed okay after his return okay from so in other words um, you were gonna be like co-equals with God just as Jesus when he was on the earth in the in the same flesh that we're in he thought it not robbery to make himself equal with 
god. Okay. Now, um, I hope that's real simple, real easy to understand because, um, uh, it seems like a lot of people get that confused. Okay. The Lord God will give Jesus the throne of David. All right, so I'm not saying it's wrong, but Jesus is God. Okay, so the God gives the Son of Man, Jesus, the throne of David, and he says David's throne was never in heaven, it was in Jerusalem, on earth. Okay, so that's, uh, you know what, I don't, I'm going to get sidetracked if I go down that uh, angle, but uh, I could say the opposite is true. Okay. There is no earthly um, kingdom. Jesus has always been a spiritual kingdom. Right now, we are the nation of God. Let's do it this way. But you are a royal priesthood and holy nation, talking about us Christians, okay? In Jerusalem today, they have, um, it's dominated by Jews that reject the Lord Jesus Christ. This earthly kingdom, if you will, it's not the kingdom of God. They all reject the Lord Jesus Christ over there today. Jesus is not going to come down, kick them all out, and then um, ha still have unsaved people living around. Them. This is comic book stuff. This is fairy tale stuff. When Jesus returns in the clouds of heaven, it is the end of the world. All right, just like what Daniel talks about, just just like what we read in Matthew twenty-four. Mark 13, Luke 21, when Jesus is asked specifically, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So when he comes in the clouds of heaven, it is the end of the world. It's not a beginning of a thousand year period. And again, you know, I, these guys, I'm telling you, they don't want to talk about what happens <laughs> I really you know what happens when Jesus stops reigning okay what happens when he takes over you know and then what happens uh, you got unsaved people having sex all around you are you in charge of all the you know the sex shops or you know what's going on here in this thousand year period in, a, in essence, when Jesus comes back in the clouds of heaven, it's not the end of the world. Or, you want to say that when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, death is destroyed forever, and there's a thousand year period where it's peaceful, and there is no sin, and then once that thousand year period is over, we can go back to partying with the devil. I mean, this stuff makes no sense at all. It doesn't make any sense at all. So um, I want to finish with this here. Uh, and um, it's still something horrific, priceless. And Hell's convicted killer just feet away. That our claims to be a Christian. And I, I told him, you know, he claims to be a Christian. And I said, but your life doesn't show that. Gloria Matthews tenderly remembered her younger daughter. As mom, I remember much. Yes, she's feisty. Yes, she's opinionated. But she's also tender-hearted, sensitive, and loving. The judge handed down a life sentence with a the cruel and senseless Stephen Packey has a lot to answer for. Forgive him what we can't for a Christian. Can you forgive him? No. 
We can All right, hold on. Listen to that. Gloria, you're a Christian. Can you forgive him? No. All right, so we see another one of these cases. You, you got a feel for this lady here. She, Her daughter was murdered, and it obviously bro breaks her heart. It broke her heart. Uh, the poor woman, I can't imagine what it would be like to lose a child. Uh, I know I've talked, uh, you know, spent a lot of time with my grandma, you know, in particular after my mom passed away. Very, very difficult. Uh, my grandma lost two daughters. And that uh, has to be a hard thing for any parent. And then she lost her daughter, I think it was the age of 14. Very, very difficult. But also, uh, we have to remember, okay, if you don't forgive men their trespasses, why would the Father forgive you of your trespasses, right? It, it wouldn't be right if you're not forgiving others and then you expect God to forgive you <clears throat> it's okay it's just not right so we ought to forgive others so if we it's hypocritical if you beg God to forgive you of your trespasses then you you got no choice you have gotta forgive others and it's hard I you know I'm just <laughs> I know because I, I've got evil thoughts that go through my head when I think of how somebody has did me wrong. It boils my blood and it's hard to get out of my head. And it's hard to not think about. But I just remind myself that I have to forgive those people. Because I've done wrong to people. And believe me, I want them to forgive me. But how can I be honest about this if I don't forgive others who have sinned, trespassed against me? So the, the only right thing to do is to forgive them. All right? It doesn't mean you have to go drinking beers with them or whatever, you know. You don't even have to hang around it, but in your heart you have to forgive them. Otherwise you're not going to have peace. And you have to trust God that God will make everything right. So uh, that's the only way. That's the only way. So it, I hate when I see somebody say, I don't forgive them. I'll never forgive them. Because this poor lady here, as hurt as she is, she's also not perfect. She also needs forgiveness. Whether it be from somebody else or... If from nobody else but God and you need forgiveness from God so if you're gonna have to if you're if you're gonna want God to forgive you you have to forgive others that's the only way to have peace now this is not a salvation issue okay don't confuse that but it's a peace is issue All right in order to have peace in your heart you have to forgive those who trespass against you we can, we can forgive him, but we can't forgive what he did. Okay, so I don't. He's trying to split hairs there. You got to forgive him. All right. You have to forgive him. That's the only, only way to have peace in your heart. Okay. Let me finish with one verse. Jesus says in John chapter fourteen, "Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you." Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid.